All right, good morning. Well, it has been a little bit disjointed over the last few months, but we have been working our way <coughs> through the book of Colossians over about seven or eight weeks. And we've come to the end. So if you can turn to the book of Colossians chapter 4. The book of Colossians chapter 4. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I have enjoyed going through this book. Uh, you can read and read and read, and then when you go preach through something, you get uh, a little bit more depth out of it, and it, it really encourages you. And I've been encouraged just to consider the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, His goodness, who He is, what He is, our relationship we can have with Him, and that's what we've been looking at over the past months. And it's exciting the fellowship and the relationship we can have with our Saviour. But all doctrine is practical, is it not? And I think here in this last uh, passage, Paul brings it uh, down where rubber hits the road and he wants us to then put into practice that which we have learned. And so the title this morning is Living What We Know. Living What We Know. But if you've got Colossians chapter 4, you can be upstanding. Now, we'll reference some of the later verses in the chapter, but we won't read them now. We're just going to read from verses 2 to 6. It reads, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be your way with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can look into it this morning. We thank you for the testimonies that we've heard and the time that we were able to consider Christ and his work on the cross. Lord, as we consider your word, I pray that your spirit would speak to us, that we'd be encouraged, that we'd be challenged to perform in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Living what we know. Living what we know. Well, you'll remember that in the beginning, it was Paul's desire that these believers here in Colossae would go from uh, a place of spiritual infancy and, and spiritual immaturity to a place of spiritual maturity. That was his prayer for them, that they would increase in the knowledge of God, being fruitful in every good work, walking in a way that was pleasing to God. That was his desire. And that's the desire of God for all of us as his people, to grow. And so toward that end, he has been teaching them about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so we looked at the Lord Jesus Christ as preeminent, the Lord Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, uh, us complete in him, uh, the believer risen in Christ and uh, living a life that is different, putting off those things which uh, are the old man, those things that pertain to the flesh, those things that are not pleasing to God and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and absorbing him into our life in every aspect of our life. And so Paul's been giving a lot of doctrine and then application, doctrine, then application, doctrine, then application. And then he comes here to verse number two through to verse number six, and he gives them two things to sort of wrap it all together. Two things to wrap it all together. He goes, now that you know this, now that you understand truly who the Lord Jesus Christ is and He's wonderful, and now that you understand that the relationship that you have with Him is one where uh, you don't live the life you used to live before, you live the risen life. Uh, you don't live as those that are without or as those who don't have Christ. You're different. You're risen with Christ. Therefore, seek those things which are above. You're different. And so because of all of that, if you understand that, he's saying, if you've absorbed that, if you've realized that Christ is all, then he goes, I want you to come in verse number two, and he speaks to them about the subject of prayer. The subject of prayer. That is living what you know. Now, this is something that Paul does quite often. If you look in uh, the book of Ephesians... He talks in the first few chapters about who we are in Christ and what we have. And then he talks, this is how you ought to walk. Walk in this situation, in this situation, in this situation. This is how we conduct our lives. 
We get to chapter 6, he goes, but there's going to be some opposition, isn't there? So you need to arm up. You need to put on the armor of God because we're fighting a spiritual battle as we walk through life, as we conduct our life. And he wraps up the book of Ephesians, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And he says, there's so many things that we can know and we put it all in our head and we go, yeah, that's a great idea and that's a great idea. Now, how do we live what we know? And he challenges them through prayer. Prayer is that way that we can absorb those things that we've learned and actively live them out in our life. Prayer, verse number two, continue in prayer. Now, some of you know who uh, Archbishop Trench is, but he said that prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. Sometimes we think that when we pray, I'm trying to get God to do something that he doesn't want to do. And I need to convince God and I need to prepare my argument very carefully and I need to explain, God, this is why you ought to do this for me in my life. Or this is why you need to meet a need here. Or this is why this needs to happen. And in our mind, we are trying to overcome God's reluctance. And the reality is that God is there saying, this is what I want to do in your life. I want to make you fruitful. I want you to increase in the knowledge of God. I want you to enjoy fellowship with me. I want you to be fruitful. And prayer is our opportunity to lay hold of his willingness. God's not going to force these things on us. God's not going to just take us like a robot and uh, without any of our desire or without any of our input, uh, make us the mold. He says, no, 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 I have my power working in you. I've given you of my spirit. This is my desire for you. I've given you my word. I've given you of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're complete in him. You have everything that you could ever need to walk with the Lord. Now, would you perform it? This is what I want to do. And so as we pray, we ask the Lord, Lord, I know what your plan is for me. Would you help me to absorb that into my life and get going on that same path that you've got for me? I love that quote, and I think it's one that we can, we can remember. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. And so he says to pray, to pray. But not just to pray, he says continue in prayer. Now, he's not saying you're already praying, keep doing that. Good job, guys. It's literally laid out in prayer. Prayer is the subject here. The quality of prayer is that it should be one that is perseverant, one that is persistent. Mark chapter 3, verse 9, you don't need to turn there to help us understand that. It just says, And he spake to his disciples, that's the Lord Jesus, that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. It's the same word there, wait. What was happening is the Lord Jesus would often teach down by the Sea of Galilee and... There'd be a hundred people there and then there'd be two, three, four and then there'd be thousands and thousands and the Lord Jesus would be pressed back, pressed back. And so what he'd have is he'd have one of the disciples or a few of the disciples with a little boat. They're waiting, constantly ready, right at hand so that if the crowd got too big, he could jump in and, and in scripture we see that sometimes that he got in the boat and he preached from the boat. But that idea of it waiting there continually, always at hand, always ready. That's the challenge that our prayer should be. Acts chapter 10, verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And you understand this is Cornelius. He's a centurion. He's a commander of 100 uh, Roman soldiers. And that's only the soldiers. Then they would have different orderlies and servants. So he was a fairly important man. He ran uh, a fairly big house. And so here he had three people, a soldier and two servants, who would, their whole job was to continually follow behind him and whatever it was that he needed, they were there at hand. Night or day, rain or shine, they waited on him continually. This is what Paul is saying our prayer ought to be like. He says, if we've truly understood that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, remember in chapter 1, he's God and he's preeminent. He's over all. He created all things. By him all things consist. And, and that he's the one who died for me and enabled me to have fellowship with God 
then prayer ought to be something that's right there by us, close beside us, never gone too far, always there at hand so that we can always enjoy fellowship with God. Romans 12 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer doesn't mean that I need to be praying 24-7, but it means that the attitude and the spirit of my heart and my communication with God is such that the boat's always there at hand. It's never gone far. The orderly is right there waiting. That is a persistence and a perseverance in prayer. Now, pray for what? Prayer is a very broad subject, isn't it? We would all agree that we need to pray more. But for what? Or how? Or why? And Paul began this book with a prayer. And he ends it with a prayer. And the prayer in the beginning was spiritual growth, wasn't it? If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 1, we'll just quickly refresh. Verse number 9, he says, We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So what was Paul's prayer? Paul's prayer was that you might understand what it is that God wants of you and that you might grow to please him And that you might understand that this is not in your strength, but that it's God's power working in you to bring about the end that he desires. That is Christ-likeness. That was Paul's prayer. And so he then teaches them about how they can understand God's will by acknowledging their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledging that they ought to be separate from the world and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He teaches them and then he comes back to the prayer that he had for them. And then he says, now I want that to be your prayer. I want that to be your prayer because... Prayer enables us to live what it is that God has for us. We know all of these things about the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, do you pray and say, Lord, would you help me to know your will today? Lord, would you help me to, as I read in your word and as I consider Christ, would you show me something, maybe a truth for today, something that's going to push me forward a little further so that I might be able to walk worthy unto all pleasing, Because, Lord, as I walk, I want it to be pleasing to you. And, Lord, as I'm walking pleasing, you've promised that you would bless with fruit. And, Lord, I want to be fruitful for the glory of God. So would you enable me in that? And do you see how this idea of continuing in prayer is that that ought to be the attitude of our heart every day as we speak to the Lord about these specific things. Lord, we're headed one direction. And as we pray, we are communicating with the Lord. We're saying, Lord... I'm laying hold of your willingness. I know this is what you want for me. I want it too. Let's work together on this. I want to become like Christ. That's living what you know. Because, you know, so many of us, we hear all the truths that are in here. We know all the truths that are in here. And they're up here. Yes, I'm dead. My life is hid with Christ in God. Do you live that way? Do you practice that? How do I do that? Well, I need to speak to the Lord and say, Lord, that's your purpose for me. You can help me. You're not going to force me. So enable me. Prayer enables us. We looked last time about having Christ in our character and all of these different things that as we realize that I'm risen with Christ and I seek those things which are above and as I understand it's all about Christ, wow, these things in my life, they start to change. Putting on, that was bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, all these different things. Charity, allowing the peace of God to act as umpire in our life. Do we pray and say, Lord, would that be true in my life? We looked at the Lord Jesus Christ in our family. Do we pray as husbands and fathers to say, Lord, would you help me to fulfill the role that you've called for me here to love my wife and not be bitter against her? We know it up here, but we want to live what we know. And so Paul says, pray. Continue in prayer. 
as wives, do we go to the Lord in prayer and say, you've said that it's fit in the Lord that I would submit to my husband. Lord, would you help me to do that? Because I want Christ in my family. And as children, do we say, Lord, would you help me to obey? Because that's well-pleasing to the Lord. As fathers, do we say, Lord, I want to bring up my children appropriately. I want to nurture them. But I want to be careful that I don't provoke them to anger. Lord, would you help me as I, as I make decisions as a father in my home for my children? I want them to grow up to know God. I want them to serve the Lord. Hey, do we spend time in prayer? Saying, Lord, would you enable me in the things that I know? I don't want it to be a head knowledge. I want this to be part of my life. I want to truly say, yes, I'm dead. My life is hid with Christ in God. That's the way I'm living. Not only does prayer enable us, but prayer extends us. Look in verse number three. We'll come back to verse number two, but look in verse number three. So Paul's challenged them about praying for their own spiritual growth and and enabling the work of God in their own lives and then extends it a little bit more. He takes it from there and he, he broadens it a bit and he says, with all, or that's also, in addition to what you're already praying, you need to start there. Start with prayer that God would make you to become like Christ. That's his plan for you. Make that the bulk of your prayer time. Make that something that's very important every day that I continue, I persevere, I persist, that in all things... God, would you work in me? Would you make me, me submit, submitted to you? But then he says, in addition to that, extend it a little bit, would you pray also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He says, you know who Christ is, right? You know what he's done for you. Remember Christ in you, the hope of glory? Remember that wonderful mystery that I explained to you? That the Lord Jesus Christ is what Paul's saying. That's a wonderful thing that you learned that the Lord Jesus Christ who created all, who's above all, who established the church, he's the one that redeemed you and he's the one that lives in you and dwells in you. And that was a wonderful mystery that Paul said. And because that's true and because now you're understanding that and you're saying, Lord, this is the way I want to live. Wow. There's, there's a new way. I don't need to live as the old man. I can live as the new man and I can be uh, created and, and formed into the image of Christ. That's a wonderful thing. And he says, well, not everyone has that. Not everyone has that opportunity because not everyone knows Christ. And so he says, as you're praying for yourself that you might grow into uh, fruitfulness for the glory of God, consider others who don't know Christ. You know, so often we just pray, bless this person, bless this person, and Lord work in our life. And it's very inspecific. It's very just for the sake of it. We pray for the sake of it. He says, no, 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 get serious about what you want God to do in your life. And then broaden your eyes and see what God's doing out there. He says very specifically, pray for me, not just generally. And so Paul's their missionary and we have our missionaries. And we want to pray for them specifically that God would open unto them a door of utterance. That is opportunity to speak. Now, where's Paul now? He's in prison, isn't he? Most would think, oh, well, there's not much they can do. Time's up. We'll go elsewhere. No, no. God wants to do wonderful things. And God used Paul in many, many ways when he was in jail. You think through Roman history and some, some, they had some pretty bad emperors and rulers. And at this time, it was Nero. And he was one of the worst. You know that Paul got to stand before Nero and very likely share the gospel with him? Because people prayed specifically that even in the situation that he was in, Lord, would you give him opportunity to share the gospel with others? I wonder when we pray, are we being specific about what God can do in us, but are we being specific about what God can do in the lost? So prayer enables us, prayer extends us. But the challenge is pray. 
pray and come back to verse 2 so continue in prayer that is be persistent persevere Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And David was saying here that uh, as we burn incense on the altar, that is my prayer to you. And someone drew the connection that the incense, sorry, if there is no fire on the altar, the incense will not rise to God. Sometimes our prayer is, Lord, bless this, bless this, do that. There's nothing there. There's no fire. There's no energy. And our prayer is worthless. But if we're to have an attitude where where we continue in prayer, we persist in prayer, we're persevering in prayer, there's going to be a fire there. But not only continue in prayer, he says, and watch in the same. And watch in the same. And this is a, uh, a typical principle throughout Scripture, to watch and to pray. Matthew chapter 24, verse 43 says, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. There's that word, just to explain it. What does it mean to watch and pray? Well, here he's saying that if, some, if you know someone is going to break into your house on a certain night, what you're going to do is you're going to be very vigilant, you're going to be very diligent to seek out uh, which doors might be unlocked, which windows he might be able to get through. Uh, You're going to stay awake. You're going to make sure that nothing distracts you because you're going to do everything in your power to keep him out. And he says that attitude is what needs to come alongside our prayer life. Now, we first see this in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 9, we know that Nehemiah was busy building the wall and there was a lot of opposition, wasn't there? And so as there was opposition, the opposition began verbally and then it became very much a physical attack. And in chapter 4 and verse 9, Nehemiah says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God, unto our God, and set a watch against them day and night. And so here were the two elements together. They understood that they had a job to do, but there was opposition. They knew that they needed to pray but they needed to be careful that they wouldn't uh, just be completely lost and forget about the opposition that was out there. And so they split themselves in half and they said, half of you stand guard, grab your sword, make sure they don't come in. The rest of us are going to pray. And those two elements together enabled them to seek the face of God while still being understanding of the challenges that were around. And as we pray, there's many challenges that come. We get distracted, don't we? We get attacked by the devil. There's many different things that we desire to pray. We desire to seek seek the Lord's face. Yet so often we fail in doing that. Nehemiah wanted to build the wall and acknowledged he needed the Lord's help, but he acknowledged that he also needed to be diligent, to be vigilant. Matthew chapter 26 verse 41 says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you know the story how the Lord Jesus Christ, before he was crucified, took a few of his disciples for a very serious time. This is where the Lord pours out his heart before God. And the burden of what was about to come, what he was about to accomplish on the cross, the Bible says that he was sweating great drops of blood. And he poured out his heart before the Lord and came to the point, well... Lord, I'd like it that this cup be passed from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And wow, what a very serious thing as the Son of God is in communion with God the Father. And you know, there were a few disciples who were invited to be a part of that. What a special honour and a privilege that would have been. You know, you read through John chapter 17 and there's a lot there. And they were going to be right there. Imagine that, kneeling there side by side with the Saviour as they spoke to God the Father for strength for what was to come, that the will of God would be done, that souls would be saved. Imagine being able to do that with the Lord Jesus himself. What did they end up doing? They went to sleep. What a missed opportunity. 
Why? Because they failed to watch. We can acknowledge all of the wonderful truths about Christ in Colossians, all of the wonderful things that we need to do. And we say, okay, I need to get serious about prayer. That's how I'm going to enable the power of God to work through me. That's how I'm going to get on track with this. I need to pray. But if we don't have that attitude of watching and vigilance, we forget that there's an enemy, enemy that's trying to distract us. And how many times have you purposed to pray and fallen asleep? Or purposed to pray and been distracted? Or purposed to pray and gotten busy? Because we failed to watch. And there they missed out on a wonderful blessing. First Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It's the same word there to be vigilant. Understand that we're in a spiritual battle. And we can't just one day decide, yeah, I think, yeah, I need to walk with the Lord a bit better, don't I? Yeah. Walking with the Lord and endeavouring to walk in a way that's pleasing to Him is not something that's done willy-nilly. It's not something that's just done by the way. This is something that Paul says we need to truly understand, get on our knees before the Lord and continue and persevere in prayer and say, Lord, this is what I need to be doing. Lord, would you work in me? Would 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 you help me not to hinder the Holy Spirit's working in my life? I understand that this is your glorious power working in me. I don't want to get in the way of that. And, and this is the, the idea here is of a man that's on his face before the Lord and is very vigilant knowing that this is not what my flesh wants. This is not what the devil wants for me and I need to be very careful. I need to get in the battle. This is going to be some serious praying that's happening here. Look in chapter 4 and verse 12. Here's Epaphras putting this in action. He says, He's always laboring fervently for you in prayer. That is, he literally gets on the mat and wrestles with God. That's someone who took his prayer seriously. That's someone who understood that there was opposition. That's someone who decided to watch and pray. That verse we read before in Matthew 26. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Until we acknowledge that our flesh doesn't want any of this, we're never going to grow spiritually. Revelation chapter 3 verse 2. The Lord Jesus is speaking to the church at Sardis. And he said, you have... A name that's living, but as a church, you're dead. How sad for the Lord Jesus to acknowledge that you're a dead church. And what was his remedy for them? In verse number two, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He said, You dropped the ball, you forgot to watch. Your spirit was willing, but your flesh was weak. You weren't vigilant. You weren't awake. And so the challenge is, if I want to please God with my life, if I want to honour Him, wake up, be vigilant, watch. Watch and pray. So He wants us to be persistent in prayer, but He wants us to be perceptive in prayer. And then he says, watch in the same with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. This morning we had the Lord's table. Wonderful opportunity to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Even just the ability to pray. How wonderful is it that we can come before the Lord because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and find mercy and obtain help in time of need find grace to help in time of need. That's a wonderful privilege. So as we're on our knees before the Lord, consistently persevering, being perceptive, watching and praying, we say, thank you, Lord, that I can come before you 
and that you desire to work in me. How wonderful is that? Very quickly, moving on. He doesn't only challenge them on their prayer, he challenges them on their practice. Look at verse number five. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. He challenges them. Well, if you're risen with Christ, remember, we're living the things we know. If you're risen with Christ, if your life is hid with Christ in God, if you're complete in Him, if all of these things are true, then be careful of your testimony. Is Christ really preeminent in your life? If He is, it'll be visible. Walk in wisdom, that is, guard your testimony. In 2 Samuel 12, 14, David was challenged because the way that he lived gave occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. In Titus chapter 2, it says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, moving through, verse 10, showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. And the challenge there is for the believer. And the picture there is that the gospel that they are proclaiming is like a diamond. It's beautiful and it shines and it has great value. And he says, you as the believer are like the setting. Now the setting, if you look at a diamond ring, can showcase that diamond to the best of its ability. It can really draw everyone's uh, eye, not to the setting, but to the diamond. And they can see what's wonderful and what's beautiful about it. Or you can get one that just chokes it and, oh yeah, there's something shiny in there. Not sure what it is. Oh, well, move on. He says, your life as a believer is like that setting. How are you going to live? If you live in a way that is like you're not risen with Christ, if you live in a way that you're living just like you used to live before, and then you go and share the gospel with someone, we heard in a testimony this morning, we can give a tract, but if our life isn't different, they go, why? What have you got that I don't? And so he says, be prudent. Guard your testimony. Live what you know. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. The word they're redeeming, it means to buy back. It means to purchase. To buy out all you can. We know in <laughs> Ephesians 5.16 we're to redeem the time because the days are evil. That doesn't mean... Evil in Scripture doesn't always necessarily mean sinful can just mean some form of calamity or, or stuff's happening. So the challenge there is buy out or purchase all of the time that you can because we don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of calamity around. We don't know if we're going to have tomorrow. We don't know if the opportunity that we have today will still be there tomorrow. What Paul's trying to do here is he's saying... There's some wonderful things that the Lord Jesus wants to work in you. If you truly understand that, it's going to involve you in prayer for yourself, but for others, it's going to extend you to see what Christ can do in others. And he challenges them on their practice. How are you living, not just for yourself between you and God, but are you influencing others to come to Christ or are you not? Do you care what your testimony is like at all? Because we don't have much time left, he says. Walk in wisdom or be prudent, redeeming the time. You'll remember just in the chapter before, he reminded them in 3 verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then she also appear with him in glory. There's something coming. You don't have all the time in the world. And we look at others and go, oh, well, they serve God, but I don't have time. We've all got the same amount of time. The challenge is to redeem it. That means to purchase it, to buy it back. That means it costs me something to get that opportunity. I have to purchase it with something. There's an exchange. Oh, look at that person. He's able to serve the Lord, but I can't because I'm too busy. No. That person made an exchange. He realized that there's an opportunity. The opportunity is now. And so I may have to sacrifice something else to purchase that opportunity so that I might influence someone for the glory of God. Why did I do that? Because Christ is my life. It's all about Christ. It's not all about my career. It's not all about this. It's not all about the fun or 
the different things that I like to do. And they're nice. But redeeming the time costs me something. And then he says in verse number six, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. He's talking about the way they walk, the way they conduct their life. Firstly, be prudent. Remember to purchase time. Purchase those opportunities. Buy them. And then be careful to proclaim. Let your speech be always with grace. How do we communicate with others? Not even just the gospel, but how do we talk in general? Is it because God is working in me, the Holy Spirit is working in me, and then whatever comes out is full of His grace, that's able to challenge someone, that's able to motivate someone, encourage someone, convict someone. We want it to be with grace. We want it to be seasoned with salt. And salt, we know that they would put on different things to uh, hope to arrest the corrupting influence of, of bacteria and different things. And we want our speech, our lives, we want it to be something that has a mitigating influence on the corruption of the world. And then we want it to be prepared, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. I wonder if your interactions with others are such that you're leading them to ask questions about spiritual things. I hope they are. And sometimes we get that far, and then they ask a question, I don't know. Are we prepared to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ who's done so much for us? He's built this whole book talking about just how wonderful the Lord Jesus Christ is and the things He's done for us and how we can have life in Him and how we absorb Him into every area of our life. And then He says, you've really got to get that. Because if you're living the way that the Lord Jesus wants you to, people are going to come up to you and ask, what's going on there? Rubber hits road. Do you really know? Do you truly have a relationship with Christ that you can say, yeah? Can I tell you about my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ? I was a sinner and he saw me in my sin and he died on the cross and he paid the penalty for my sin so that I could be free from sin. And now that I'm free from sin, I'm dead to that. I no longer live that way anymore. And I have new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's enabled me to be able to put off the different things that my flesh desired and to put on a new life which desires to please the Lord. And I've realized the reason that I'm a little bit different is because I've realized that my life is not on earth anymore. My life is hid with Christ in God. And so because of that, I'm trying to seek the things which are above. And I'm trying to lay up treasure in heaven. And I'm trying to absorb Christ in my life and in my character. And I'm trying to absorb Christ in my family and in my workplace and in every area of my life. Why? Because I want to please God and I want to impact you. That's where he's bringing it all together. Is that true in our life? Living what you know. You know there's probably nothing that we've covered in the book of Colossians over the past months that you didn't know. But do we live what we know? 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about doctrine having purpose. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. If our doctrine doesn't influence us into application, we've got bad doctrine. If everything that we've learned and discovered about the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't influence us into prayer and practice, we missed something. And what you'll find here in the last uh, 12 verses here, he's saying hello from a few different people and say good day to this person and this person says hello. Let's just really quickly look. We see Tychicus or Tychicus, who's a faithful minister. We see Onesimus, who is a beloved brother. We see Aristarchus, who's a fellow prisoner. We see Marcus, who's helping out. We see Jesus Justice, who is a fellow worker. 
We see Epaphras who's laboring fervently in prayer. We see Luke who's the beloved physician. We see Demas. We see Nymphus who's invited the church into his home. We see Archippus who is endeavoring to enter the ministry. You know what we see? We see a whole bunch of different people all doing a whole bunch of different things but faithfully serving the Lord. And the last thing I want to leave you is participation. Living what you know. He's told them all of these things. Now pray. Bring it in. Practice. Put it back out. And participate. Get involved in the ministry. You know, you've got Onesimus who was a slave now in the ministry. You've got Luke who was a doctor now in the ministry. You've got all of these different people. You've got this guy, Nymphus, who we don't know that he was in the ministry, but he said, you can meet in my house. We've got a young man, uh, Archippus, who believes the Lord's called him into ministry and is taking that step. Hey, they're all at different stages doing different things, each one of them understanding who Christ is, what he's done. Now let's put it into practice. One thing that stood out for me very quickly in verse number 9, Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? See again in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you? We here at Crossroads, we hear things every week. We get challenged. Every week, hopefully, we get encouraged. We hear from our missionaries. We hear of things that are going on. There are people constantly getting involved in ministry. And sometimes we think that's a them thing. And I've, there's only so much that I can do because I just don't have, I don't have the time that they have and I don't have the opportunities that they have. And Paul dismisses all of that and he said, redeem the time, you've got to buy the opportunity. But he said, look at this guy, he was one of you. Look at Epaphras, he's one of you. None of these guys were anything special. We never see that Luke preached anywhere. But Luke would pick up the phone. Paul's been stoned again. All right, I'll go help out. Luke was able to write the book of Luke, write the book of Acts. He did his part. Archippus there, he was able to, he was able to pastor. Nymphus there was able to open his home. Aristarchus, he was able to be with Paul in prison. Each one had their part. Each one had been challenged and changed by the Lord Jesus Christ and they allowed it to be applied. We know a lot. Do we let it work out of us? First of all, would we, would we pray? Would we practice? Then would we participate? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful blessings we have in him. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as believers to spend much time in prayer, continuing in prayer, being vigilant, knowing that there are many things that would distract us, that would destroy us. But Lord, we want to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. And I pray that we would be men and women of prayer, that we would be a church of prayer, asking God to work in us and through us. Lord, I pray that we would practice what we've learned, that we'd be careful to Walk in wisdom to those that are without, endeavouring to reach them with the gospel. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to participate in ministry where we can, making opportunity, endeavouring to serve the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your glorious power that works within us and your desire to do wonderful things through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.